he was going to get rid of all the Jews. I mean, it was really not his business, but he was an evil person, he was a monster. Uh, and um, France was occupied uh, by uh, the German soldier. I always use the word Germans, I'm sorry, I, I, the word Nazi did not exist in my days when I was a little girl. And I went through the war, uh, between the ages of four and uh, ten, when it was all over for us. Uh, and uh, I remember wearing the Jewish star. Uh, this is what I have to wear on me. Uh, and it's in French, and it says Juif, which means Jew. Uh, and then it was in all the different languages that the Germans occupied. And for a little girl, this was pretty big and it was yellow. And I told my mother, oh, it's so pretty, because I was wearing like a green dress or a green knit, and then this was yellow on the green. That, that's all I understood. You, you understand me, that it, it didn't mean anything to me. But it was uh, a terrible sign. And my sister, who was older than, uh, than I am, and she's still alive too. And the teacher took her to the head of the class and said to all the children, you have to be very nice to this child because she's living through a very difficult times." And we, we stayed in Paris. Um, my uh, parents were from Holland and my mother was from uh, Germany. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, so I, I, I met my grandparents, but uh, I have no recollection. I do have some photos, which is a good thing. And you can show a photo? Oops. Oh, that's a, okay. The, the baby is my mother, and then my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my great-great-grandmother. And that's on my mother's side of the family, they were German Jews. Okay, can you take the next one? Oh yeah, that's the something that I have that's probably the only thing from my grandmother. It's a beautiful bracelet and it's from the 19th century. Okay, what's next? And that's my grandfather, you know, my name is Jacqueline. And my parents were so hoping to have a, a boy because my sister was there already. And his name was uh, Jacob, he was dead already. And so Jacob, and because in French it's Jacques, Jacob. So Jacqueline, um, my name is up to him. Okay, what else is there? And that's my grandmother, uh, Sophie. And, uh, and we called her Omi, and she, uh, in 1941, she was still in Hamburg, Germany, and uh, the Germans were all over, took her away, put her in a special 
house with all the other Jews. And then she saw that she had to report and then she committed suicide. She took an overdose of sleeping pills and she, she didn't want to go through the ordeal of going to a concentration camp. Uh, and I, I don't remember. I really don't remember her. I don't remember any of my grandparents because my other one uh, was murdered in the concentration camp. So I, I never had any grandparents. I hope some of you have a grandparent. Yes? Yeah. Yes. And you're lucky, see? You're very lucky. Okay, and that's my, the baby's my father and then his big sister and his big brother, and they also disappeared in concentration camp. So I never, I never knew, I can't remember them. All I have is some photos, but lucky we have some photos. Okay, let's see the next one. And that's my father as a little boy. He was in, uh, in, in Holland, as I say, he was Dutch. And then, what's the next? And that's my parents. And so they were newly married in 1930, and they were a happy young couple. Never did they dream that uh, those hor horrible things would happen. Although Hitler came to power, you know what year he came to power? Because you have read uh, Night Lady with Yes? 1933. Excellent, yes, that's right. Very early. My parents were just married a few years, and my sister was just born, and he came to power. And almost immediately, he started laws against the Jews. At first, Jews in Germany, but then he invaded all those neighbor, neighboring countries, and he started uh, giving orders to the authorities, the police, and uh, and uh, starting to deport the Jews. And the lucky few that could escape, uh, a lot of them went to the U.S. Actually, and maybe among your grandparents, you have they have neighbors that uh, were able to escape from Europe. We didn't. I know that my parents tried, but they were very young, they had very little money, and you had to pay for your passage. Plus, the U.S. did not give, except for a few, an entry visa. You needed a visa. You might have heard, you might have some family that lives overseas. It's very difficult to get into the U.S., and you had to pay for your passage. Anyway, it was impossible for my parents. And we stayed in Paris until the summer of 1942, when things were really, really, really bad. And my father found two smugglers, two young men, when they were 20 years old, and uh, for a certain amount of money, I don't know, my father got the money, and uh, uh, we crossed uh, into the south part, uh, southern part of France. Let's see, let's see the next, maybe I have a, no, that's my parents in Paris when they were happy. That's my grandparents, that uh, my grandmother who perished in Sobibor, the concentration camp. What's the next one? Oh, that's my sister and me, we were babies. And uh, that's why I don't remember my grandparents, you see. Okay, what's the next? Oh yeah, and then we went to the seashore, and I was so afraid uh, <laughs> of the water, but we, we made it. Uh, that was still before the war. And Okay, that photo, oh, it's gone. Uh, that photo you just saw, that's the last time I saw my grandmother, but I was two years old, so that's why I don't remember. And uh, that's the photo, that's right. And uh, I'm the little one and my big sister there. And uh, so I have no recollection of my grandparents. And the next one uh, is, uh, oh, when the war started, everybody was so scared. We were in Paris. And we went, uh, we, we left Paris in a hurry. My father got a little car from his business. And we went to um, that little village. And the family of those two girls gave us their dining room. And we could sleep there. We spent a few weeks. And we were about the same age. Of course, I was uh, the youngest, and my sister, and the two uh, girls. Uh, and uh, the parents were wonderful people. That's what I say. That's why I say that uh, there were some wonderful French people. Fortunately, otherwise I wouldn't be around. Uh, but then the armistice. You know what an armistice is? When you sign with a, another head of government, and so uh, Hitler and Pétain, the head of the French government at the time, shook hands and decided, that, okay, Hitler, you can have the country, and but leave us a little corner. So France was divided into uh, two parts, and uh, so my parents um, 
try to get to the so-called free part, and that's when they got the smugglers. So um, there was a huge roundup. You know what a roundup is? They rounded up the Jews, like 14, uh, most of the Jews in Paris, but they forgot to ring our bell or to knock at our door. And although we were registered, they didn't come for us. They came for us two weeks after we were gone. So think of luck. So uh, every day was luck for us. It's incredible. The last night when we were supposed to meet those smugglers, we slept at some wonderful friends of uh, ours, and it, they were risking their lives. You know, you were risking your life when you helped Jews, and it was strictly forbidden. And the lady of the house, she was, I, I can remember her face, her name was Geneviève, and she gave my mother, my sister, and me a Catholic medal. You know, most French people are Catholic. Yeah, anybody's Catholic here? Yes, oh, that's great. So you know what a medal is. You put, maybe you have a medal, no? Yeah. And uh, this was, uh, in French, we call it Notre Dame de Lourdes. It's a little village, Lourdes, in the south of France, where there were miracles in the 19th century. And so Geneviève, that lady, said, this will protect. And it's, I'm so happy and proud that to this day, I have a medal. It's very dear to me because who knows, maybe that helped us. So we left Paris. My parents um, had those wonderful friends, and, and uh, uh, the, the two boys uh, were uh, 15 years old. They took my parents' backpacks and they bought tickets because Jews were not allowed to any of that. They couldn't, if they had quarters, you know, they, they asked in, in the metro, in the, they asked paper, please. And they, on my parents' papers, we didn't have papers, my sister and me, it said Juif in big red letters, so they would have rounded up immediately. But we left at 6, six o'clock in the morning to go to the train station. And they, uh, miracle, another miracle, there was no um, police to ask us, I mean, French police. <laughs> Uh, to ask my parents for their papers. So we got to the train station. My parents got their, um, their backpacks. They had their, whatever they could have for their lively possessions, you know, probably a change of clothes and maybe a sandwich or something. I, I don't know. I didn't have anything. Didn't even have my doll. Uh, and uh, neither did my sister. And we got on the train. And the train moved became frantic. My father went in the, in the corridor and that woman said, oh yeah, they are rounding up Jews on the other side of the tracks. They didn't make it to our track. They didn't make it to our train. Another miracle. Everything, every day was a miracle. And they probably had the amount, they, you know, they were rounding up a certain amount of Jews per day. And maybe they had a, a thousand or maybe 500 Jews, I don't know. And they say, well, okay, we'll put them on the buses and send them to a uh, camp. And then they didn't get to our train, which is incredible. So, we didn't. so and then we got off the train and we had a, a, a date, if you want, with those two young smugglers. They were only about 20 years old. I mean, not much older than you in this class, but they lived in that area. It was like a border, you know, and uh, you have a border here between here and Mexico, for example, and uh, you might know some people that uh, had a lot of, I mean, that went across the, the Rio. What's the name about Rio? Uh, between Mexico and the U.S. Anyway, they have to they have to smuggle across uh, the river, the Rio, to get into the U.S. Well, for us, of course, there was police everywhere, and so we crossed the demarcation, which it was called the demarcation line, and we crossed in the middle of the night. It was midnight, and I, I remember. And once, at one time, one of the smugglers said, "Hold on your feet, because the Germans were right there, you know, like at the end of the road. And uh, at that time, my sister said, I have to do pee pee. I mean, it sounds funny, but you know, if they had heard us, that would have been the end of us. But, uh, and then the two young men, the smugglers, had a bicycle. So one of them went ahead, and uh, the other one uh, pushed my sister and me on the bicycle rack, and one of us in the back, and so we could go faster, because we couldn't run very fast. And we were very, very quiet. 
and we made it across. And then there was um, the good French police, they were still allowed to be there, and they say, uh, one of them say, I remember the words of who goes there, in French of course, and we knew that we were safe for the moment. And the, the soldiers took us to the, um, uh, to their, uh, what do you call that, their, uh, their camp, if you want to, you know, soldiers live in the, uh, yes, to their barrack, and we slept, we spent the night, but then they couldn't keep us, of course. So the next morning, they took us to the next town, and my parents didn't know anybody, and so they checked into a hotel. But in the hotels, they, uh, the police checked whoever, because they were other refugees, not just us, and they checked everybody, and of course, my parents were arrested, we, the four of us were arrested, and I had to go to the police station. It was the evening. My father was interrogated for 15 minutes. He had this, uh, it said, Zrif, Jew, on his ID card, you know. And then my mother, and they had to um, say, yes, uh, I left Paris. I was not allowed. It was against the rules. But being a Jew, I knew that uh, uh, they would deport me right away. So I did something illegal. And then my father said that he had four 4,000 francs, which is not much money, but in those days it was a little bit on him. And then my mother said that she had uh, the same amount of money on her. And uh, so then they transported us uh, to the big town. You know, France has uh, what's called département. It's like a local government. Here you have states, and you have a capital for each state, right? And uh, there in France you have like a state, and so we were, they deported us, or they sent us to the capital, and then my parents were interrogated again. It was a long interrogation, and uh, the man in charge, after one month, when my parents had to report every day that they were there, that we didn't escape to some hidden village, and uh, they gave us permission to go and hide in a minuscule village. We were under surveillance, we were under watch every day. They knew exactly where we were, but they let us go there uh, in that village. And I remember very well. Can you give the next uh, picture? Oh, that's my mother and the two of us. Okay, and the next one, that's me again. And then I. I wrote a birthday card for my mother's birthday in 1941, and then, okay, you have seen that already. Okay, this was France divided in those two parts, and so we were able to cross in the so-called free zone. Two months later, all of France was occupied, but when we crossed, it was still, there were still no Germans in there. Later on, there were. Let's see the next one. Oh, that's the interrogation. You can't read it, really, but that's my parents' interrogation. They wrote it all down. And uh, what's the next? Okay, that's the other side. Okay, that's the village. That's the house where we were allowed to go. We had the, the two rooms upstairs on the right there. You see with the blue shutters? That's where we were. And for uh, almost three years. But my sister and I went out, actually, and we, um, we even went to the little school. We, didn't, we were not wearing the Jewish star, because in that part of France, you didn't have to wear it. But my parents had a, a, a travel permit, a temporary travel permit, where it said in big red letters, Shreve, again. So they could be arrested. We all could be arrested. We were uh, registered all the way to uh, the headquarters uh, called Vichy uh, in France. And the Gestapo, which was the German police, came actually one morning and they surrounded, I think, five cars, they surrounded the house. And the village said, that's it, it's for the Mendel's family. They thought it was for us. But it was for the, the railroad man that lived downstairs, a very nice uh, young couple, and they were arresting him because he had been denounced that he had a code, a password for the, uh, for the underground, you know, friends had uh, some good guys and they were in the, in the women too, uh, that were in the underground. And so he had been in the So, the, the so this is what she got, had she had to wear. And uh, his, uh, so she and was showing up and, I, and you could have seen. And to say what the password was so they could get some other underground people. 
He never said a word. He was transported to a prison not far away, and he was kept three weeks. He came back alive. He never said uh, he was tortured. Uh, he never spoke about it. Um, I saw him after the war when I was grown up. Uh, but you know, to save his life, he could have said, don't take me, take the Jews upstairs. He never said a word about us, another miracle, right? So there we were, and my mother uh, was frightfully afraid. She was in daily scare that the, the Germans were going to come. Let's see, what is the next picture? Oh, that's that little school where we went. And they call, you see, if you know French. And uh, for a while. And that's where my sister and I went to get water. The, the, the two rooms, they had no water, no electricity, no toilet, no nothing. So my sister and I went to that pump, uh, which we saw many years after the war, still the same pump, and we carried water to our two rooms. What else is there? Okay. My father officially got a permit to be um, a farm worker. So he wouldn't be sent to uh, Germany to work in, uh, in the fields or to, as a Jew, he would have been deported immediately. So most of the time, uh, he was on the farm of those, uh, that wonderful family who gave us food, but he was in hiding. Uh, and that, it wasn't like a dilapidated old house. And uh, there was a, a thing, a wooden plank to shut it down. And let, let's see the next one. There it was. That's where my father was hiding. He couldn't lie down. He couldn't stand up. He had to crouch. My poor father. That must have been an ordeal for him, you know. And then when the when it was clear that the Germans had gone through, uh, then one of the children of the farm would say, "Okay, you can get out." And then he worked a little bit on the farm. Okay, what else do I have? Oh, I think that's it. But you can't. Can you see anything there? No, you can't. I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's the, the temporary travel permit that my parents got that allowed them to go on Saturdays, like to the doctor. Of course, if you were sick in the middle of the week, tough. And, uh, but we could be arrested any, any time because it said, please, on that piece of paper. And I, 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 my, my father kept those papers, one for my mother, one for my father, and I donated them to the Holocaust Museum because it's a, you know, it's an important paper that, uh, I think, I think maybe I have something else to show you. Yeah. This is it, and you can pass it around, and it says Juif, you see? That's what my parents, uh, okay, you can show it to the class. Uh, so it was incredibly dangerous. Yeah, they had to have it signed every three months, but they couldn't go to the town where they had to sign, so the mayor of the village was a wonderful man, and he uh, warned us whenever there was a danger, and we went to hide in the, in the woods. We, we were hiding uh, in a chicken coop in the summer, and it must have been a large enough chicken coop. Uh, and then we had girl up bags to cover us uh, to spend the night. Um, but again, nobody denounced us. They were really, really brave people. Only once there was a little girl of my age who said uh, to the other friend, aren't you ashamed to, to, to walk with a girl who is a Jew who is dirty like a pig in a stable? That's how she insulted me. You can imagine, I started crying. I ran to my mother, look what she said to me. And uh, I don't know, she must have heard that maybe the parents were not good people. But they never denounced us. But the little girl said those terrible words to me. Right? That's not very nice. And uh, my mother became pregnant, and she had a terrible pregnancy. She carried the... Uh, the future's a baby to turn, and then she had to be transported, although it was strictly forbidden for us Jews, 
but she was medium, etc. And but she made it with my father to the hospital. And again, there was a wonderful people, the doctor there on one side. Don't forget, at that time in 1943, all of France was occupied. There was no such thing as free France anymore. And on one side, the doctor took care of the German soldiers because you know they could have had a something on um, their head, their feet, you know. And on the other side, uh, the doctor helped uh, ordinary farmers, and he accepted the Jewish woman. And uh, my brother was born there in August, one of the worst times in World War II. It was on August 7, 1943. And my parents named him Franklin. Would you guess why they named him Franklin? Yeah? Exactly, because their only that's pretty good, their only hope of survival at that time was Franklin Roosevelt. That's right. So they named him Franklin in West Franklin, and it's not a very usual French name, you know. But that is a name they gave him, and that's how he was registered. And uh, so then uh, my mother almost died, my brother almost died because the milk didn't agree with him. And uh, finally, uh, he was crying all the time. He was skinny, like his, his, his feet were, uh, I mean, his legs were skinny, like, like a finger. And, uh, but he, he survived, and then in the village, where my mother returned finally, after months in the, that hospital, uh, my father discovered uh, uh, Nestle condensed milk. And I was just telling uh, the person that came with me this morning that, I don't know if she's there, uh, that uh, the Americans in uh, 1940, uh, actually end of 42, had landed in North Africa, in Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and they were given those K rations, you know, the food that they give to soldiers. And they still do, I mean, uh, during the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Afghanistan War, the Iraq War, they always, the soldiers always get K rations. And they wear cans of that condensed milk. Have you seen Nestle condensed milk? So it still exists, right? And so my mother diluted it with the water that my sister and I got, and she boiled the water, of course. and. Uh, and that is really with my brother, so he survived. And I remember when the can was empty, I licked it with my finger, it tasted so good. You know, we didn't have much food, and so that was something sweet. We never had any sweets, we ate chestnuts and whatever we could get. Once in a while we had an egg. But uh, so licking that empty uh, can for me was uh, the supreme gift. It was amazing. So things were getting more and more uh, difficult and dangerous for us, and we spent a lot of time in the woods, and uh, so did my parents. And uh, finally, finally, there was uh, D-Day, uh, which is, you know, what that means, D-Day. Maybe you learned in history. D-Day, yeah. Huh? What? Wasn't it when the United Forces arrived to uh, fight back the Germans? I don't understand what they're saying. Speak up. Wasn't it when um, the United Forces went to fight back against the Germans? That's right. I, actually, that was the landing, you know, of the Americans and many of them here, <laughs> of course. You might have a grandfather that was part of those American forces or British forces or Canadian forces, I don't know, but you might. And whenever I meet somebody like that, I always say, thank you, you saved our lives. Because from one day to the other, we didn't know whether we were going to make it one more day, you know. And um, so, I, in French, it says, um, it has a different name. It's not D-Day, it's, they use the whole word, débarquement, like, I don't know, in English. And I knew how to write that, so I had a journal and I wrote Le Débarquement. And for us it was, you know the date, anybody? Huh? June 6, 1944. Oh, you're pretty good. You must be a history specialist, that's right. <laughs> that's wonderful, that's absolutely right. So many people but you know, it doesn't mean that the war was finished because the, uh, by that time the Germans knew that things were bad for them. 
but uh, they were still all over the south of France and they retreated. But as they retreated towards Normandy, where the Americans were, uh, they were killing everybody on the passage. And uh, there were some underground people, French underground people, that tried to kill them. So they were killing back and forth and back and forth. And uh, they, I remember that they went through our village, actually. And I was a curious little girl. And I, I opened, I put my head on the window. And my mother said, what happened? You know, they can shoot you. And, and, and uh, so lucky I obeyed my mother. And I went down on the, on the ground, you know, there in, uh, in, in, in one of our two rooms. Because uh, that would have been the end of me. They were shooting everybody on their passage. And there were some horrible killing. and. Uh, they were hanging those underground people on trees and they were burning, they put the, putting people in churches and burning them. And the, there's a village in France very close to where we were where they burnt the whole village. And the village has stayed like that. They never rebuilt it. And it's a museum uh, showing the destruction and the horrible things that the German did. And uh, finally, uh, they, they got to Paris. Uh, the Germans, but by that time uh, they were fierce fighting between the American troops and uh, the Germans, and uh, many people uh, were killed among well the Americans, but mostly also the uh, the underground people. And then the uh, the Germans just uh, ran away, and uh, they went to the eastern part of France. There were still some terrible battles, uh, and many Americans died in the battle called the Battle. The bulge. And um, then uh, my father heard that, um, that they had left Paris. Paris was liberated. You may not know the date, but that was the 25th of August, 1944. By, it wasn't the end of the war, but it was the liberation of Paris. And then that same year, towards the end of the year, 1944, my father said, well, I have to go back to Paris. Our apartment had been occupied by the Gestapo the whole war, but they fled, you know, by that time. And so my father wanted to get our apartment back for us. And I don't know how he went to Paris, by foot, by bicycle, by, I didn't have a bicycle anymore. And I don't know, but it took uh, quite a few days. Now it takes three hours on the, uh, on the fast train, but not in those days. And he got back to Paris, and his business that had been area that had been taken over uh, by the occupying forces and by, and by the French government. Of course, there was nothing left. Uh, so anyway, my father took our apartment back and told uh, whoever was there, this is our apartment, I want it back for my family. And he came back to get us, and we got back to Paris. And, and then by that time, there were some trains. And uh, we got back to Paris in November 1944. And uh, that's when my father found out, little by little, through the International Red Cross, that everybody in his family, brother, sister, cousins, mother, uncle, aunt, they had all perished uh, in concentration camps. And uh, right now, my closest family, there are 23 people that disappeared like that, and were murdered, gassed. Uh, well, sometimes they perished on those cattle trains. There was even a little cousin of mine, she was 19 months old, and uh, she was one of those that appeared in a disaster. And, um, well, I could, you know, it's difficult to talk about five years of horrible events in, in, in half an hour. I'm not sure how long I talk to you, but uh, I just want to tell you a few more things that France now, 70 years after uh, those terrible events, uh, the French government is officially apologizing for what they do, did against the Jews. And I was just on the telephone before I came this morning uh, with the um, uh, Prime Minister's office in France uh, because my sister and I and the daughters of my brother who died who committed suicide. Anyway, his daughters and his wife um, and my sister and me should get um, a certain amount of money. I have no idea what. But they are finally working on this to uh, compensate us, as if you could compensate for that people. You can't. 
but you can give a little bit of, uh, of money. And so that's one thing that finally the French government is doing. And then the other thing is that our village, who, who, that did miracles for us, was honored two years ago by the French government as one of the villages uh, that saved Jewish families and their children and grandchildren were being honored. That was two years ago. I think, uh, can you go with the, uh, with the USB? Can you turn to the next photo? Or is um, that the last one? This, I, I only saw one file on the USB. Yeah. There's nothing else? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, in that <coughs> tiny, tiny village, it still hasn't changed those 30 houses, but there's a tiny town hall and there's a plaque, and it's, they don't say any names, but they say those words I just told you. Uh, oh, you're the one that has the USB. Then there's a, oh, that's my brother. That's my two cousins, that's, so that was my brother. Though my two cousins survived. Uh, they are in California, but their parents, uh, that's my sister and me, and at the end of the war, we received clothes from America. And I was so proud, I was wearing an American coat. <laughs> you know, there was nothing for it. There was a, a hotel where Americans had shipped uh, clothes. What else is there? Oh, that's the initial list of the people in my family that were murdered. But now I have a much bigger list. That was so we were in Auschwitz. Uh, what else is there? Oh, that's um, in Paris, in uh, some areas in the center of Paris where children were rounded up from their schools just because they were Jewish children and they were taken by the French police to concentration camps. Okay. So now uh, those schools where there were the most Jewish boys and girls, uh, there is a plaque. No names, but still. Uh, souvenir, pretty sad, but it's there. And then what else do you have? Yeah, that's the plaque in the village that was put two years ago. And it says between 1940 and 1944, um, I can't read it. <laughs> uh, found, the Jewish families found um, shelter in that village and uh, those families were chased and hunted by uh, the French army of occupation, because it was the French, unfortunately, and, uh, and the government of Vichy, that's the occupied, that's, that's the French again. And thanks to the goodwill and, uh, the, uh, and the work of the, uh, the farmers today, the children, the grandchildren of those families uh, have to be uh, thanked for what their parents and uh, all the other citizens did because it was extremely dangerous. There were risks for them. You know, you were, if you helped the Jews, then you could be uh, sent to a concentration camp yourself or to a work camp. Um, and so they say that they memory of those people should be there forever and ever. It's a wonderful plaque. And uh, that's it. Yeah. And so my sister and I got a scholarship. We had to catch up with our schooling, of course. And then uh, we made a life. And, uh, and both of us married an American and came to the US in the late 50s. And fortunately, my brother, who had suffered so much since he was features and then a young boy and then an adult. Anyway, he committed suicide at age 44, which um, was tragic. And to this day, I, uh, I cry when I think of him. It was a terrible thing. And his two daughters and wife are alive. But you can imagine, no father, no husband, uh, to die tragically. And uh, OK, I'll say one last thing is that my mother carried with her cyanide pills. And uh, if the Germans came for us, she told my sister and me, I'll give you a little pill, you'll die right away, and you will never suffer. And I knew that. I told the little boy, and my sister told the little girl. And uh, then I forgot. We forgot it. 
And then when we went back to the village a few years ago, they reminded us, they are my age now, you know, I said, you know, Jacqueline, what you told me? And then it all came back to my memory uh, that my mother was going to commit a family suicide. And they told the village, that's what is going to happen. The Mandel's family will not accept to go to a concentration camp.